Hello, everyone. I'm Leslie Kaufman. I'm a senior climate change reporter with Bloomberg Green. And welcome to the Bloomberg Green Summit and really my favorite panel of the day, and I hope yours. It's with National Geographic. And National Geographic is a favorite brand, a favorite uh, institution of this nation. And today we have the honor, really, of dealing with some of the most interesting people at National Geographic. I'm going to introduce our panel one by one and ask them to speak a little bit about their work. Um, the first person I'm going to ask to introduce himself is Dan Raven Ellison. He's an explorer with National Geographic. Uh, and I have to say, I love his bi a biography, which calls him a guerrilla geographer. He's a former geography teacher. I'm hoping he'll maybe talk a little bit about his work and how he came to be a National Geographic explorer. Yes, I'm yeah. a guerrilla geographer. Guerrilla geography is radical, alternative, surprising geographies that get people thinking about the world, certainly challenge myself and others to think differently about the world. And a few years ago, about seven years ago now, I started a campaign that led to London becoming the world's first national park city, which is a new kind of national park. And I think, you know, coming at the tail end, hopefully, of this awful epidemic we're in at the moment and the ecological and climate crisis we're in, I think we know now more than ever how important it is that we make our cities greener, healthier, wilder, fairer, and cooler. And, you know, where can we look to for great ideas around how we can achieve those things? And actually, I think, for me, growing up as an explorer from the age of three, four, five, visiting national parks, I think we can look to our national parks as these incredible places with brilliant ideas about how we can achieve that. And by taking those ideas and imposing them, um, um, augmenting them on top of cities, we can change the purpose of cities and inspire people to do extraordinary things. Terrific. Um, in addition to Daniel today, we have um, Jenna Jambach. Jenna is an award-winning explorer. She's a distinguished professor and director at the University of Georgia, and she's been conducting research on solid waste issues for 20 years. She's particularly interested in plastics and, of course, the huge problem of marine debris. Uh, Jenna, thank you for being with us. Thanks so much. Uh, I'd like everyone to imagine uh, quickly, if you're holding an empty water jug, uh, what, what is your instinct to do with that? Are you thinking um, you want to get rid of it as soon as possible? And then do you recycle it? Do you trash it? If you're my husband, you're thinking, wow, this could be used for something else. And he wants to cut it in half, use the top as a funnel and you know the bottom as a dish to hold nails or something else. And this human dimension of waste management is what has kept me drawn to this and, and kept me working on this issue for so long. Uh, in 2001, when I heard about our waste ending up in the ocean, I, I knew that we were doing something wrong on, on land. And I've been working to study this issue ever since then. And uh, we quantified in, in 2015 that about a dump truck of plastic is entering our oceans every minute. And since then, um, I've really just been trying to do science that can inform policy. Some of these science has been used um, at uh, global discussions, including the G7 and the G20. And I've been able to testify um, to Congress several times as well. Um, but recently, my work has gotten to uh, with the community level. So these global models, really, I see where we're driving this is at the community level. And I was really honored to be able to co-lead the Sea to Source Ganges expedition with National Geographic in 2019. And that was with working with communities all along the Ganges River within India and Bangladesh with an interdisciplinary team uh, led by women um, with local partners. And, and that was a really meaningful experience. And they're working towards solutions on this issue as well now. Jenna, thank you for explaining your work. That sounds incredibly exciting. Our next panelist uh, is herself uh, a philanthropist, an investor. Um, she is the chairman of the board of the National Youth Society. Jean Case, I'm hoping you can talk a little bit about your work with the society since you've been there and some of your bigger goals for the society and what you're trying to achieve. 
Sure. Well, thanks, Leslie, for having us this morning. And thanks for allowing me to go last, because I think I don't have to say too much after following Dan and Jenna. You can see very clearly how explorers are in our DNA. At National Geographic, we really say we're nothing without our explorers. You know, we're 133 years old now, but the mission has pretty much stayed the same, and that is to use the power of science, exploration, education, and storytelling to illuminate and protect the wonder of our world. And, you know, Jenna and Dan are great representatives this morning of a class of explorers all over the world, richly diverse, many of them indigenous, doing work in their own communities, as Jenna uh, just referred to. Um, and it's a really exciting time. And although we're a 133-year-old nonprofit, uh, we like to call ourselves a 133-year-old startup, because just as the earth is evolving, we're evolving as an institution. And so digital has come to play a really important role in reaching people and getting messages out there. We're able to amplify and really spotlight the work of our explorers around the world, and it's a very exciting time. Well, I definitely want to come back to that digital message, and we're because it's a very important one and a very important way to communicate, and everyone knows that National Geographic is one of the most broad-based uh, digital brands out there. Before we did that, though, I wanted to talk to everyone, uh, including Eugene, and maybe we'll start with you and go in reverse order, about the role that conservation and particularly climate change now plays in what the National Geographic has to do. I mean, it's not just about preserving beautiful places, though it is certainly that. How does climate change play into the work you're doing now? Yeah, well, again, I think you're going to hear some of that on this panel, which will demonstrate what explorers are doing out there. But even sort of in terms of global initiatives, you know, one thing we've been focused on for some number of years now is an initiative called Pristine Seas. And in that work, we've worked with governments and partners all over the world to set aside marine protected areas been very successful. There are 23 of them now around the world that we've worked on, including 6 million square kilometers of protected ocean today. Um, on land, we have a number of different conservation um, efforts going on, including with the Okavanga in um, Africa. So across the board, I think it's taken on an urgency. But to be honest with you, we could go through those chapters that I talked about in the last 133 years, and at any point, point, you will see conservation and protection of the earth has been so key to our work, including our role in helping bring forward the National Park Service in the United States. So it's been a big part of our DNA. And I think, if anything, it's just, uh, you know, multiplying as we go forward in this time of crisis with the climate. Jenna, when we talk about taking plastics from the ocean, that's about preserving an ecosystem. Does it link back to the warming of the seas in any way? Do you see these things as interrelated or do you see yourself as having to face different challenges like pollution first and then acidification or other issues? Yeah, I think what we see, and, and I observe this myself um, when I crossed the ocean in 2014 um, with a team of, of only women on a 72 foot sailboat, um, uh, yeah, I was going to follow up on this ocean component that that Jean was talking about because that's where I really saw, you know, evidence, evidence of the plastic, evidence of climate change, um, and and I, you know, as an environmental engineer working on land, mostly this was just extremely eye opening as well as just personally one of the hardest things. Um, that I had ever done, leaving young kids at home, um, not being a sailor whatsoever and doing all this sailing. And, you know, I think this also ties back to what Dan had said, sort of getting outside, getting into nature, experiencing what you actually see um, in terms of these impacts real hand. And so standing um, on the islands in, in the Canary Islands before we left, um, I was standing there looking out at the ocean thinking, okay, we're going to be, we're going to be crossing you ending up in the Caribbean. And I looked down and each wave had a confetti full of plastic. So the ocean wow. was literally like spitting the material back out at us. And it just was like, th this is it. I, you know, this is what I need to do. Um, but th the thing is, is that there's synergy with all of these impacts to the ocean. It seems so vast. It seems never ending. Um, but it can't take all of this, all, you know, all of this pollution and the climate change, they all, you know, come together to impact the ocean as a whole. 
Daniel, and let's talk about your works with parks. It's about getting people outside. Is there a climate change component to your work as well? That, I think a lot of people talk about climate change and isolation as if it's separate from the ecological crisis. And obviously, the two things are strongly linked. And then people often talk about climate and ecology as if they're separate from people. And actually, we are species that are having a, a big impact on the world around us. And I think we have to see things in that context. So for me, my framework when thinking about how cities can be national parks, there are some fundamental reasons why I think that makes sense, right? So, so firstly, I don't think that urban life is worth less than rural life. The peregrine falcons in London, which are more numerous than in Yosemite National Park, are just as valuable, just as beautiful, just as awesome as those in, in rural areas. The people who inhabit cities are just as important. And go figure, we need incredible habitats, just like orangutans do. But crucially as well, it's people in cities who have extraordinary power through our voting power, our consumption power, our power to, to green our streets, our houses, and to have a relation, better relationship in cities, that I think is absolutely key. So when I started the campaign around the idea of a London National Park city, I was actually kind of wondering, wondering as a geographer why it was that there are glacier national parks and desert national parks and rainforest national parks, but not city national parks. Why would we exclude ourselves from this brilliant idea? What I came to realise over a half decade or so is that I think what's really the what the real problem is, is that national park thinking, large scale, long term, holistic systems thinking is missing from our cities. So I think actually, if we're going to tackle the ecological and climate crisis, we need to break down some of these artificial boundaries that exist in our imaginations between urban and rural and between people and the rest of nature. It's a it's a really great idea and a one that's sort of paradigm shifting. And I appreciate your engaging in that. I guess my next question to you is in and Jean, maybe you can give us the overview on this, is National Geographic is sort of unique in its social media profile reach and impact. Jean, I'm hoping you can sort of just discuss the reach of National Geographic on, on social media and, and how you're trying to use that. And then I'm hoping each of you individually can talk about your engagement on social media, what works, what do you think engages people in the work you're doing and in the greater issues? And, and what doesn't work? Jean, should we start with you for the overview? Sure, sure. Well, you know, I think one of the things that's very unique about National Geographic is in some ways it's a hybrid organization because we have a unique joint venture with the Walt Disney Company that doesn't just extend to social media, but includes media and travel and consumer products and a number of things. But through all of our, whether there are cable channels, our magazine, our social media reach, we reach nearly a billion people around the world every month. Social media alone, we're coming up on 200 million on Instagram, for instance. It is the largest Maybe. social media footprint of any brand in the world. And we don't say that bragging, we say that celebrating because we are trying to use these platforms to spread the important messages of you know hope and exciting exploration and science taking place out there and we feel like you know we have a really big tribe around the world that's locked arms with us and are really committed to the same kind of ideals that we have as an institution and that our uh, explorers take forward every day Dan do you have any thoughts I mean as a as an explorer do you engage on social media and on platforms with people and with followers and have you found like what what excites people and and what if anything will give you sort of negative feedback well, i'll just give you three quick examples i mean i just think campaigning for starters for the london national park city which launched in 2019 wouldn't have happened if we didn't have a social footprint and weren't able to connect with people who other, we wouldn't have otherwise connected with and now there are sort of campaigns in around 25 cities around the world for cities ranging from sacramento to adelaide to become national park cities and most of that connectivity has happened through uh, social media. Um, more recently, I've been involved in a piece of work which has all been about creating footpaths connecting all the towns and cities in the UK. And that was about reaching out to volunteers to create 100,000 kilometres of routes. And again, that was done entirely through social media, that re outreach during the first lockdown in Great Britain um, during the sort of COVID epidemic. And then more specifically with National Geographic, you know, I'm really interested in how people think about the world and how people's geographic imaginations are quite often distorted. So I found out uh, through a bit of work with Friends of the Earth that one in three people in Britain think that half of our island is built on. 
So people's mental framework for their voting, for their decision making on a range of issues around more space for nature or around migration is around this idea that large amounts of Britain is used for um, housing effectively. In reality, the footprint is about 5%, but the footprint of animal related agriculture is close to 50%. So I decided to make a film where every second of the film is 1% of what the country looks like from above to help readjust some people's imaginations around what that looks like. So now most children who, who, take, uh, who um, study geography in school at some point will watch this film and that geographic imagination will be corrected. And ultimately, you know, if we're thinking about how we can tackle the ecological and climate emergencies, one of the biggest things we can do is think about how we can rewild and rejuvenate and restore land and how we can, I think, re reduce animal-related animal agriculture and free up more land for um, forests and wetlands and, and important spaces like that. That's, those are incredibly powerful examples. I'm wondering, do you ever get pushback? I'm going to go back to you on this. Do you ever get negative pushback? I mean, here in the United States, climate change and some of these issues are controversial. Do you ever get things that people respond negatively to, or have you not experienced that? I think the most frustrating thing sometimes in terms of responses is more people who you know they're on your team, but they're naysayers. And so you end up wasting time talking to people who are on your team about some weird bit of scientific detail, rather than growing the internet bubble and bringing more people into the church. I think that's the challenge. You know, we're, we're all living in these sort of internet bubbles and it's about reaching new audiences. And one of the fantastic things I think National Geographic does through especially its photography and its filmmaking is help to reach those new audiences. Jenna, now I'm gonna ask your experience. Do you also engage on social media and do you engage with individual people? I'd love to hear anything you have to say out of the unusual in terms of what do you think people have most responded to in terms of what you've done? And have you had any sort of pushback ever? I mean, plastic is is controversial as well, though I think everyone can agree with like cleaner seas. We might disagree as to what the steps are needed to take to get there. You're exactly right. Um, so, so uh, yeah, first let me say yes, I engage on social media. Probably my, my most used platform is Twitter. And um, I'd like to use an example of, of working with National Geographic as well. Um, 10 years ago, we developed a citizen and community science-based app called Marine Debris Tracker. And this app is free and open. Um, the data itself is open, which I think is, is really critical. And um, we have a new partnership. So we're working now with National Geographic. It's been out 10 years, but the partnership is fairly new um, in their citizen science division and with their education community. And that app itself, similar to Dan's situations, that has only grown with one person working with me and social media, you know, over this time and over the years. And of course, now the new partnership, it, you know, it's grown quickly in the past years since that started. Um, but I think what people really want to do is feel engaged. I mean, I think you have more sort of, I think, a negative uh, and a potential negative interaction when you're trying to tell people what to do, um, you know, and trying to maybe lecture. And, and I, you know, I understand this as a professor, kind of that's what we sort of do in our classes, but we don't have to do that. We can engage people in activities and you don't have to cross the ocean to, you know, see the, the evidence of what's happening in our environment and, you know, to collect data and make change. People can just go in their backyard um, wherever they are and use this app and many other apps. There's iNaturalist for biodiversity um, and collect data. So it has that technology connection um, that, you know, citizen and community engagement connection. And then guess what? The data is available to everyone. Nobody owns it and everybody has access to it, um, yet we all own it, right? So you can use that data to uh, make decisions in your local community, to look at the picture globally, um, in your classrooms, in the education campaigns. Um, so really some of these situations are, I feel if you approach it in this way, you have a lot more positive engagement on social media. Um, but your point 
about, you know, how you approach the solutions or interventions to this issue, especially plastic. Certainly there's controversy around that. Um, and certainly there's been, you know, negative responses on Twitter. But I think, again, if you approach it in the way that I talked about, really about engaging and, and um, bringing everybody sort of to the table for a discussion and how they can contribute, it works better. So I think that's a good place to go next, which is the role of National Geographic. And in general, I think everyone watching this panel can confess that their secret desires to be a National Geographic explorer, what kid in America grows up doesn't secretly want the best job. So congratulations to both of you. But for the rest of us who are gonna you know, remain desk jockeys, um, let's talk about how in your work you're helping people either through the schools, um, or otherwise to engage. And so, Jenna, you've just talked a little bit, uh, both Jenna and Dan. Jean, do you want to take this next piece of the question? Yeah. Yeah, I'd love to. And, and can I just say, you know, what Jenna just talked about, and a lot of Dan's work includes as well, is almost helping people feel like they're in the field with the explorers by giving them tools and asking them to be reporters, if you will, of what they're seeing. They, almost never look at their community the same way. Once you engage them in the process of paying attention and being our eyes and ears on the planet for us. But education has also played a really strong role. Obviously, both Dan and Jenna here have had you know, professional roles in education. Um, for us at National Geographic, the last year has been a really unique time to reach more people. Again, as many students were learning from home and as there were a lot of desperate parents needing some additional support, we have over a million teachers with us. And we have had a program called Explore in the Classroom. And um, one thing I'd love is, you know, Jenna is on expedition right now, and uh, part of what she has done is gone into the classroom, literally, physically, which wasn't happening in the last year. Um, but Jenna, talk a little bit about, you know, what you did. And, and I think it'd be really fun to hear about, you know, this current expedition that you're on now. <laughs> Sure, yeah, so um, I'm currently on expedition uh, with the Mississippi River Plastic Pollution Initiative. It's uh, the mayors along the Mississippi River, the United Nations Environment Program, North America chapter, and National Geographic Education, and then us at the University of Georgia. We're using that mobile app that I talked about, Debris Tracker. Um, and this is very much, uh, you know, rooted in this community science. People along the entire Mississippi River for three weeks are collecting data on plastic pollution to get a snapshot. Um, but we also engaged all of the National Geographic educators along the entire river. Um, we did uh, pilot city-based programs in Baton Rouge, St. Louis, and uh, St. Paul, Minnesota. And so um, really this has just been incredible. I mean, I'm just, overwhelmed, honestly, by the participation and the data coming in. Personally, for me, this has been a journey as well. Um, I'm living out of a camper and uh, traveling the entire stem of the Mississippi with my family. Because of the pandemic, they are my expedition team. I have two sons, 10 and 12. They are collecting data in transects. My husband is helping me with the tech and, of course, driving this camper. Um, and so we were able to stop in a classroom. Um, you know, a lot of things have been virtual. We engage virtually with the educators and many of the communities, but we were able to stop in um, and actually engage. And that was incredible, the same age as my oldest son. And just to have that knowledge exchange, they had gone out and collected data um, and we got to talk about it. And that's how, that gives me hope. Those students are so aware and already, you know, are beyond where, you know, I was at that age. And I think that's, that's incredible. And that gives us hope. Well, so there's nothing I love more than stories of hope. Dan, as we begin to finish out this panel, do you have a story of hope for us that you'd like to share about your current work? Yeah, you know, I'm working on another project which I sort of touched on very briefly called Slow Ways in Great Britain, which is all about creating a network of footpaths that connect up all the towns and cities and thousands of villages in this inc incredible geometric network. And the principle is that you should be able to walk in a straight line between any two neighboring places. If you can't make that journey on foot, reasonably safely and directly and enjoyably, then I think maybe something's going wrong. Um, and we've had hundreds of people volunteer on creating these routes that can actually exist in the landscape. 
And for me, what I find fascinating about it on a more poetic level is that you have the root of the crow flies, which is the principle of wanting to be able to go directly between two places. And then you have the, the reality on the ground, the wiggly line that you have to take in order to, to complete that journey. And I think it's actually a fantastic metaphor for where we are at the moment with both the ecological and climate crisis. You know, we know where we need to get to. We know we need to get there really quickly as well. But we also know there's lots of things in the landscape that are going to stop us from getting there. But it's our job to collaborate with each other in a big team, wherever we are, whatever we're doing, at whatever scale we can work, whether it's in our garden or a balcony or at policy level, to work together to make that line as straight as possible. Because after all, if we can't make that journey reasonably, directly, safely and enjoyably, then actually we're in a lot of trouble. So that gives me a lot of hope that, that we're working on this project, doing our piece. And I know there's people all around the world doing their piece from plastics to National Geographic, communicating with a billion people worldwide and beyond. Terrific. Thank you very much. And so we have just a minute more before we're going to settle out this panel. Does anyone have any last thoughts, sort of parting shots, as you will, uh, on on what individuals can do if you had to say to our audience what you need to do this year to make the world a better place post-COVID, it would be what? Well, I Jenna? think we've heard. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, thank you. Jean, go ahead. That would be great. You can close out the panel. I was just going to say, I think we've heard from both Jenna and Dan some interesting ways that we are really engaging with communities around the world. And people everywhere have a role to play. We provide tools and technology to enable them to be their own explorers in their own backyard in many cases. But, you know, we are coming off a celebration of Earth Day. But at National Geographic, Earth Day is every day. And our work really is about engaging masses all over the world. Watch our content on Disney Plus. You'll learn new things. The Secret of Wales, for instance, just premiered this this month. And it's unbelievable in terms of what it brings forward for us about our oceans. But across the board, I think there's an opportunity for engagement. And we've been really inspired by the millions that have come along with us in this journey. And we want everyone to feel a part of it.